The Ensemble podcast is intended for professional financial advisors. All discussion is limited to publicly available information and should not be interpreted as legal, professional or financial advice. Ensemble does not hold an AFS license nor provide any financial services. Before making investment decisions, you should obtain financial advice from a qualified financial advisor. Hello, my name's James Wrigley. I'm a financial advisor and one of the principals of Melbourne-based financial planning firm, First Financial. I've been a long-term listener and contributor to the Ensemble Group and podcast, picking up some amazing nuggets of gold over the years. And through this podcast and the people that I'm able to speak to and interview, hopefully I can continue to deliver some of those nuggets of gold to you. Hope Housing is championing the great Aussie dream for our everyday heroes, police, nurses, paramedics, teachers and more by reinventing the way they buy homes. Hope's shared equity housing model means your clients can now access the property investment returns they've come to love without the hassle of being a landlord and at the same time enabling affordable home ownership for a deserving frontline worker. It's the win-win Australia needs right now. Hello, welcome back to another episode of the podcast. I've got the pleasure of speaking with Rich Abbey today from Peloton Partners, and we're going to get into the interesting topic of financial advice pricing or you know, pricing financial advice services. It always gets a lot of interest through the Ensemble platform and, and wherever else it's it's spoken about conferences and so forth. So I'm excited for this one today, Rich. Thank you for joining me. Thanks, James. I'm excited too. Yeah. Really excited. <laughs> uh, we were... You know, we were we were talking briefly just about a there's a a paper of sorts that 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 you shared into the ensemble community and that uh, and that's kind of somewhat prompted this this uh, this podcast recording that we're doing this afternoon. But maybe maybe let's start with 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 Pal- who, who is Peloton Partners. Maybe let's start there. Uh, I think you know different people have probably come across Peloton over the years, different presentations at conferences. I know I've seen a couple over the years. But yes, who's Peloton and and and, and what do you guys do? That's a good question. We, um, it's not surprising if you don't know too much about us. We've been around for 11 years and worked in financial advice all that time, but flown under the radar. And my business partner and I, Dave Whelan, have joined over the last year. And part of our role is to build the industry awareness of what we do and what we offer. And, and part of that's today. But they've been going for 11 years, founded by Michael Harrison and Rob Jones out of the Shadforth Group. They um, roll their businesses into that uh, conglomerate and uh, priced a lot of others to join before that was exited themselves to uh, IWF. And then they pivoted into uh, pricing for the industry and have been um, busy keeping up with demand, but as I said, flying below the radar. And what we do is we offer a sort of ongoing solution to implement a pricing framework. And rather than provide just a calculator, but provide a service over a number of years to transition existing clients onto a, a more structured way of operating and giving you the confidence to continue in perpetuity, particularly using our technology to retain the discipline um, at the pricing in the way that we see as best in class. Actually, so what are the maybe let's start with what are the, what are the pricing models that are out there that, that you see? So now I'm. I'm I'm James. I start James Wrigley Financial Planning tomorrow morning, and I've got a decision to make around how I'm going to charge by my, my clients. What are the different models that are out there that are people are operating under right now? There's the, the sort of three core ones. There's uh, well, it's a mixture of three, blend of three. There's the fund percentage base, which we were talking about earlier. There's a flat fee. There's a hybrid of the uh, of the two. And then there's also a bit of a nuance, I suppose, where some people are offering a flat fee for a one-off piece of advice rather than a flat fee for an ongoing period of time. So those are the standard permutations. Ours is quite different and has been developed and curated over that last 10 years. And uh, we can talk a little bit about that if you like, and it, but it stands alone, stands apart from from those traditional methodologies. Yeah. And, and, and so in the in an Australian financial advice landscape as it stands at the moment, do, do you have some type of sense as to uh, you, know, you know what percentage of businesses fall into one of those three different existing pricing arrangements now? Do you, do you have any, any input on that? Uh, uh, from our clients, uh, the hybrid structure is quite rare, a bit of an outlier. Yep. Um, but before we get involved, it's skewed towards fund-based uh, still, but the flat fee is growing. Okay, so it, it's 
it's getting up towards half and half. Yeah. And and how so 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 the fund base is somewhat fairly self-explanatory. The a percentage of a particular asset, whether it's one percent or half a percent or one and a half, you know, different businesses have a different different scale on what that looks like. What what about the fixed that fixed fee model? Like you, you, are you finding that there's different tiers of that fixed fee model? Or is it if you want our services it costs X regardless of what you might look like as a client? Well, the, the good question. There are variations and no two businesses are the same. Mm. Some people put a lot of uh, time and effort into deriving their cost to serve, their average cost to serve, and are very disciplined around having a minimum fixed fee. Whether they segment that business into gold, silver, bronze, or a number of meetings per year and price a flat fee that way. And some people, if they're quite honest about it, say it's somewhat arbitrary. Yeah, okay. And case by case, a little bit of finger in the air. Yeah. So it does vary. Gotcha. And and so what does your model then look like? You said it's different and kind of standard line to, to all of all of those ex, you know, existing three or so that we've been discussing. What does what's Peloton look like? There's sort of four elements to it. Um the first being it is structured so that if you implement the framework, it has an end in mind of delivering a certain profit outcome for the business. And the algorithms allow for us to predict what that outcome is going to be, whether it be in a percentage of profit or a dollar target. And we're quite prescriptive about that. And when we get to later and we're talking to the clients, we're quite overt in saying that's part of the rationale. And that's fair. And some people um, shy away from that. But that's the best way we think we can support the businesses in this industry by having that component in there. And that's more important to have a target at a business level than just at a client level. But then another element on the client side is it's really important that each client is priced individually. And we advocate it shouldn't be based on the size of their asset pool, but it should be based on the complexity of their context and number of services we are delivering to them that particular time period. The time and effort involved and cost when we look at the PL in delivering those individual services and also how much value they see in us. And, and some of that's intangible and some of that is tangible. And we break that down at the client level so that the client is paying for exactly what they're getting and what they're valuing. And there's nobody on the higher end of the fund scale subsidizing those on the, on the lower end. And that's very important from the client's perspective. Thirdly, then we look at um, the value and the conviction of the advisor. And it's really important that the framework isn't just a standalone calculator, but it is something that is able to be articulated by the advisor. They take pride in it and demonstrate their own range of services that they deliver and can present that to the client in a way that's really robust and transparent and have a direct conversation in a respectful but professional way uh, rather than just deliver a number without an explanation. And that then gives the client transparency and the respect that they deserve to understand a very professional, rigorous process is to arrive that number and where that number comes from. And then finally, to make sure the framework isn't point in time, it needs to have a mechanism to last in perpetuity. And we structure it so that each review, we do this what we call a mapping exercise, which involves a lot of IP over the years, but it's relatively efficient from an advisor's perspective to calculate the fee uh, at that point in time and embed that into the process and the culture of the organization and also the expectations of the client. That sounds like a lot of work goes into pricing each individual client. So what is, what's the process or the involvement and, and so forth to say, okay, I'm a 100% farm business right now and, yes. and, and, and I've, and for some reason I've come to the conclusion that that's not the way forward anymore. How, how do I move to move to this and then and then what's involved in me trying to reprice that hundred clients that that I look after on a on a percentage of assets basis? It's a good question. And it does involve a lot of work, but a lot of the work has been done mm. even before you engage with us. Yep. So I saw an old post on LinkedIn during the week, which um I'm going to um I'm not going to do justice to, but it was about the chap and he'd gone to into a, a, a an industrial a warehouse to fix a, a boiler or an engine, and he'd quoted to twenty thousand dollars to do that. And he went up to this particular piece of machinery, 
tapped it with a hammer and fixed it. And the owner of the machinery said, well, why did that cost $20,000? Can you break down the inputs? And he said, it was $2 for the hammer. It's $19,998 for the 25 years of experience that I'm bringing to bear on that particular day to know where to hit it, right? So all that complexity I talked about, that has been built up over, and we've made failures, um, and we've tweaked our own systems and approach, and that, but we don't ask you to reinvent that. We just do that for you, and we take your inputs and create the outcomes, and we test them with you, make sure that we're not going off um, and not validating what we're designing for you. So maybe just step through it um, a bit more methodically. The first phase is to get hold of your your PNL and your client list. And your client list needs to involve the, the fund balance, the ongoing revenue, the upfront revenue, but also the review date. And the PNL then is assessed by Ben Sutter, who's a superstar within our business. You know, long time business analyst, and more recently certified as a business uh, data scientist, I should say. Yeah. And he normalizes that PNL so that everybody's salary is comparable with the benchmark, particularly directors, and we're comparing apples and apples. And that's very important when we're looking at multidisciplinary firms and there's allocated costs that are a bit ambiguous to make sure they're done in the same way. We then take that information and cross-reference it against our data. So we've got 320,000 data points in our data warehouse, and we create a calculator that says to take this business from here to a profit margin of 30% and understanding the services that you provide and understanding the cost to serve because we survey all the participants within the wealth business, including the CSOs. We then create a calculator. And we actually then spend a lot of time with all the participants to understand the rigor in that calculator to the point that they glaze over at some points. But it's really intentional because it helps with your conviction. And when you talk to a client, you understand the rigor and you convey the professionalism that we've brought into this process. And um, we got, then I said, we'll sit down with your advice and we'll test some of those cases. And that's quite frightening but initially because some of the changes in fees are the material, particularly the low value fees who have got a lot of um, labor intensity about them. And we've been calculating on a fund basis, but we check in principle Go back to square one. This is why we've built it this way. This is, and we've had success with this over a hundred times with a hundred different firms. Is this still what we're trying to aim for? And profit still reasonable, and we still want to be fair to the client. But we may tweak some some areas to make sure we've uh, got all the, the nuances correct. We then spend a lot of time training the advisors and training the support staff on understanding all the services that they provide. It's not just about the quarterly review or, or biannual review, and we talk through the intangible values, and then we get them to look at each of the clients and go through a number of checkpoint questions, some obvious ones such as, how many reviews do you do per year? Do you manage their center link? But also, to what degree are you available on the phone to make sure this person's comfortable at all times with the situation of their portfolio, if they're very invested in the performance of their portfolio? We also extrapolate the fees of the AFSL across the entire client base, which is appropriate to cost to set up. And then once I'm confident in exp explaining what these services are, we do some role playing with objections and, and um, concerns that advisors raise may, that may be confronted uh, if they present some of this information to the client. And we also help produce a lot of material that demonstrates some of the methodology for that particular client, the questions that were answered the outcomes that came, the costs that derived for each of those individual services. And this is done on the advisor's behalf, and they can take the client through that if they suit fit. And what that does is quite a lengthy process. It enables the advisor to walk into the client meeting, not prepared for objections, but actually so confident in the rigor and what they've done and their own value that they've delivered that the objections never arise. And the clients, they don't necessarily enjoy not advocating, they enjoy their fees change, but they see, you know, the professionalism and the rigor and the confidence, and there's a certain amount of relief that this has been done in a transparent way. And you know, it's I'm still still beggars my belief that this is the case, but we have this retention rate of 98, percent and I'm surprised by that. But that's what I've, I'm seeing that evidence in the year that I've been involved in the scene. 
um, but I am surprised. And I think that's partly because we build that confidence and it's so transparent that the client understands that well, it's not a finger in the air, there's no ambiguity, they're certain of their value. This must be appropriate, you might not necessarily enjoy it. So on that point, I should say, not everybody's uh, fee increases because of this historic uh, fund-based calculation. There are some clients' fees come down mm. and that's fit and proper. They may have been more complex earlier on in their career, but at that point in time, um, they're relatively low touch and it's um, not fair for them to subsidize the rest of the business. It's interesting. Then, it's interesting sorry, you mentioned what? in there. Sorry, it's interesting you mentioned in there about about objections. You know, you, I as a you know, I haven't certainly haven't been through this process that, that you're articulating here, and 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 the it's kind of that you know the hesitation that comes in. Oh, the clients are not going to be terribly happy with this if I'm changing their fees. Certainly, if I'm increasing their fees, mm-hmm. decreasing it, they they may be a little bit more happier. It, interesting, you you, you know you, you mentioned through there about little to no objections if it's done. If it's done appropriately, and that's probably then evidenced by the client retention rate of of ninety eight percent that that you also suggested there that the clients were terribly happy with it and they were objecting to it, you'd probably have a higher drop off rate than ninety eight percent would be my yes yes in 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 all of that. So it's interesting that yeah you mentioned you know little little objections through that whole process if it's done appropriately. Right. Mm-hmm. I mean there are there are some. Mm-hmm. Uh, clients want to understand more, and we have a lot of information to share with them that's on hand in that meeting if, if they have questions. But some don't even want to go through the pack in its entirety. So no, I understand. I understand your value, and show me the figure. And it, var- it does vary from person to person. There's no doubt there's a lot of trepidation from advisors to start with ball rolling, but it is transformative for many individuals and their self-esteem putting aside that this revenue increase has no associated cost with it, so it's profit. Unlike any other business opportunity, whether it be M&A or recruiting another advisor or a referral, there's a cost to serve that that results in a, in a percentage of that revenue going to profit, and sometimes that's not a very big percentage. But the last, last piece of the, of the process is then to have a framework to make sure we execute on this rather than put the calculator in the drawer. And we work with firms for two years. It takes three months to prep this work. It doesn't take three months of effort on the advisor's part, but it takes, takes work on our time and to train the advisors. And then um, we have a lady called Alpha Pika, who's uh, another superstar, and she specializes in hand holding the businesses and the advisors through that 12 to 18 months of execution. And we have the review dates in the system, you have regular calls, make sure the prices have been mapped, see if there's any anxiety coming up, role playing again on specific clients, but also sometimes identifying particular advisors who are more nervous than others. We do occasionally build in discounts capability into the framework, and some people are very uh, eager to make use of those compared to others, and we have to um, see if that's appropriate or not. But she's fantastic, she's encouraging, She also holds people to account in a very collaborative way. And that's important. I think having somebody walk alongside you on this journey, which is initially intimidating, is a a big part of it. Otherwise, the um, rubber doesn't hit the road. And so how long do you... So there's a piece of work on the Peloton side prior to any clients really being spoken to. How long on average do you think it's taking for advisors to work through their client base to, to transition them to... To a new pricing framework, twelve to eighteen months. That you, you kind of mentioned is twelve months. Yeah, okay. twelve months is the average. There is then yeah. sometimes there are clients within that review cycle who have only just joined the business, and so we defer those conversations until after the the, the, the anniversary. Sure. Um, naturally, we still um, have that conversation, and it's still transparent and it's still well um, evidenced. Yeah. We just make sure it doesn't happen within the initial twelve months. So what, what about some some numbers around uh, profitability levels within as a percentage or some, something like that? Like what the the, the best practices out there, to, those that have tran, you know, transformed their, uh, their their pricing model, what level of profitability are, are they operating at? That's a, that's a really good question because not only does it vary business to business, it varies within those businesses over time. Mm. So at a high level, the average for the industry is 27%. 
on average, our process, we go through, we reduce the fees for 8% of clients, about 8% stay the same, and the remainder of the, about the, the fees go up. And on average, that results in a 22% increase in your overall revenue for the clients that are in scope. We do de-scope some, some outliers on occasion. And what that can take somebody's profit margin from, in one case, 5% to 25%. And that's not always appropriate because sometimes there's an inefficiency in our organization. It's not fair that the client should um, underwrite a 30% profit margin. But certainly we've taken some firms from very perilous positions to ones where they're comfortable. The tail is not wagging the dog because they've got money to invest. But what we also see is some people go through a one soft transition of their clients onto our model, and then we... We, we part company. And when we revisit them in four or five years' time, or they come back to us, their profit margin is eroded. And they've spent that that uh, capital, whether it be in IT or new projects, new resources, new premises. And they've grown to a scale where they've lost some efficiency despite that investment. And it, it, it isn't set in stone. So we've built um, some software called our Lead Out that enables businesses to keep tracking how they're pricing according to that p l yep uh, and uh, we're excited to uh, bring that to market that's partly why dave and i have joined our business mm. okay and so you you mentioned like just in in you know, general inefficiencies there you got some uh, businesses operating at five percent profit margin for and it could could be a range of different reasons and mm. we're talking for the most part about pricing of advice but but does your process also uncover just general inefficiencies where you're saying, oh, why are you doing it that way? Why don't you do it that way? Like, does, does that help in, in the process at all? Can you, can you talk to that? Yes. Again? Yes. Because we take the P&L of every organization we work with, we benchmark their marketing spend, for example. We benchmark the staff ratios. We're quite unique in that we believe we're the only business in Australia that has that level of data. But... We are careful not to uh, cloud the conversation. If we start looking at some of those changes that could be made, it slows down the pricing project and we can get distracted. And we believe that's where a business leader can make the biggest difference in the shortest amounts of time. And that then gives them some breathing space with which to address issues within the firm. Gotcha. Yep. Yep. Now, uh, as you said kind of towards the start of the uh, the podcast, there's a... There's a paper of sorts that you've that you've put up on the um, on the ensemble uh, platform, and so anyone listening through to the through to the podcast, I encourage you to to go and have a look at it. Um, maybe maybe we can somewhat kind of work through that document. Appreciate that a podcast is you know, everyone's listen. They're not they're not watching it, but we can you know somehow try and try and talk through that. Maybe if I bring it up on the screen, um, you can maybe try and talk me through it and then anyone else and then anyone listening will be able to kind of follow along so it's, it's an 11 page document that talks about pricing understanding the facts and relevant benchmarks um so yeah do you want do you want to try and talk through this uh, yes give, give it a crack yeah first of all the, the introduction is just stating that this is an opinion this is derived from the information that the businesses have given us and contains 18,000 clients. So when we look at what the market's, how the market's pricing, yeah, it, it's, it's what the, uh, the data warehouse is telling us. Yeah. On the first page, you'll see um, a chart that shows the bell curve of prices within the industry. And it's worth noting that this is a log scale, just in case it, it uh, might not resonate initially. What it's telling us is the average fee, which we don't want to put too much weight on this and don't take this as an action item, but the average fee is five thousand two hundred for the for the for the industry. The median is more like three thousand two hundred, but the large clients are skewing it. Um, you can see there's still a significant number of clients below five hundred dollars. And I understand having spent a lot of time coaching businesses, there's a lot of rationale gone into that. Um, but we generally contest that that's a, that's a fit and proper when we get into those individual businesses. The next slide is 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 more of the same. Just on that that bell curve and the and the you know the kind of average fee median fee numbers is that the is that the average ongoing financial advice fee it, it, that's not including upfront or is that the, the total revenue that a firm might collect from that one client 
in round the question. That's ongoing. That's ongoing. Yep. Okay. And then yeah, you so the, the the second one's another another series of bell curves by the looks of things. So yes. Yeah, it's yeah. the same same data but split into uh different fund sizes because that is how we're used to thinking of and and those clients with a fund balance under two hundred and fifty thousand, their average fee in the industry is fourteen hundred and and so on and so forth. Mm-hmm. The top above a million dollars, and that involves those up to uh you know, two hundred, three hundred million dollars within the family group. Um, the average is fifteen thousand, and again, it shows the median there, so yeah. people can get access to that. And so, yeah, the average is then skewed. The the average, given the average is higher than the median, the average is then skewed because of those two hundred million dollar clients. That there might be a percentage of assets under management on two hundred million, skewing the average the average fee for those what you label as established affluent. Assets in excess of a million dollars to the average fee being fi- about fifteen thousand dollars a year. Yep. Then the, the next slide um, is a scatter diagram that shows all the clients within our database and shows naturally a strong correlation between the fee and the fund. Okay, yep. and that's still prevalent trends I'm saying earlier. But then the next slide is interesting. If you scroll onto that, this is looking at when we interview each business, we ask the number of services they're delivering to their clients, whether that be estate planning, whether that be portfolio management, CFO, Centrelink, what have you. The correlation of the fee compared to the number and complexity of the services delivered is less clear. Okay. Yeah. And what you're seeing here with these two arrows is that generally the average fee is increasing to a point as the services are broadening. But as that complexity increases and more values delivered to the client for some reason, maybe the businesses are getting more consumed with delivering those services. So that's your pricing goes backwards. And so our role is to change the direction of that arrow and make sure that firms are paid for that expansion in service. That makes sense. Yeah. So the, the clients who are who are all over this chart are paying for the services they, they are receiving. Yeah. I'd encourage anyone listening to go and have a have a look at the chart, but it's 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 quite an interesting one. It goes, you know, a number of services one, two, three, four, five, six, seven along the uh, along the horizontal axis. And as you as you pointed out, you go from you know, four services to five services, six services, seven services. The clients' fees increase, which is what you would expect. You're there's more things that you're doing for them, and and so as a consequence, the client should pay. But it yeah, it it dips down when when you go from six to seven to eight to nine. The, the average fees start to dip, although the the number of services you're providing are increasing, and then it starts to take off again post uh, post post ten. Um, yeah, interesting thing to the way to to slice and 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 dice that. It's it, from a from a colors perspective, you've got there's a huge concentration of uh, well, I, I suppose no, it's just actually the way that the data is represented. You've got all these dark dots at the bottom, then the green ones, and then the light ones. That's really just the different fees that they're paying. I oh, know that's their farm, isn't it? Is that their other farm? So again, that farm. shows yeah, yeah. that shows that the fun high fund clients are paying high fees. Yeah. So you can same thing again, even though they're not necessarily getting any more service than anybody else. Yes. Similarly, though, there are low fund fees with a lot of service, and they may be cash rich and just haven't built up an asset base. You know, we deal with a lot of um, businesses who look after medical clients, and they can rapidly build their earning potential or earning capability without having and their complexity without having asset bonds. Yes, yeah, and, and yet we're not charging for those. Yep, yep. And how I just 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 on the, the you know the, the, this charging element, like where where do you find that the fees are being charged to? So if you've got that you know that that medical client, for example, that. It doesn't have a whole of assets, so to charge their one percent on their superannuation fund, there's not much in their superannuation fund. Do do you find it's being charged through through the products, through the client's credit card? Like, hey, is there any insight into where the fees are being charged to? It's it can be through the platform uh, commonly. It's just explained that it's not. There are some potential restrictions within the platform. Some platforms prevent you charging a fee over a certain percentage. Yeah. Yep. And, and that's, you know, we've good intentions, no doubt. But we, we are, again, very transparent with the client why we're charging this fee. And it's, sometimes they pay that direct from the, the cash account. And um, um, they have every chance to not pay it if they don't continue to see the value. 
So it's penultimate slide, I believe, it is showing where the value or the charges, the fees change according to the belt curve of the client as you go through our process. Um, so some of the low value clients, sorry, but high complexity, you see in the blue area, they move into the yellow uh, towards the right. It's really hard to explain this on a, yeah. on a, on a podcast, but it's not just that. It's not just low value clients, um, low phone value clients, I should say. There's also, there's a mixture when it's a high phone value that the complexity of their circumstances, their family group, their accounts, their trusts, how labor intensive they are, um, means they've been undercharged even on a phone model. Mm. Yep. And there's a lack of private app shop, which is this you were talking about before about the, this kind of uplift. So it's interesting that you start the whole, you start the whole process kind of backwards, which is almost like not, not backwards so much. It's it's the financial planning process, isn't it? It's kind of where where is it that you want to end up, and then what are the changes that you need to make to your situation to to get to where you want to end up? And yes, uh, in in the business, it's um, what level of profit are you trying to generate, and then work backwards to uh, to to get this. To that. This is slightly different. This final page. All the data originally is around when clients come to us, what their book looks like, what their client list looks like. Only a subset of that, those businesses go through the Peloton process. But this looks at a benchmark of similar sized um, businesses that have been through this framework or implemented this framework and calculates what the range of impact was for those particular businesses and therefore what we predict it would be for your business. Mm. Does that make sense? Yep. Yep. And so this increase in recurring revenue per staff metrics. Yep. Yeah. Anyone's going to have to dig out the slide and uh, and spend some time going through it. Fantastic. All right. We'll stop talking about the, the we'll stop trying to do a, a presentation via, via a podcast. Um, so anyone that's kind of interested in finding out some more, like oh, actually I had a question before we get to that. Start. So I'm start. Is it starting out a business tomorrow morning, brand new business tomorrow morning? You know, we a, a lot of what we've been talking about now is is pricing and this idea of changing the way that you're pricing mm, mm, for your mm. existing clients. Mm. How can I use this this methodology for the the brand new business that I'm starting tomorrow morning, where it's just me? I don't have any support staff just yet, nor do I have any clients. How do I use that in that brand new business? Well, it's it's. You know, it's a challenging phase to start your business and build your client base, but there is a, a silver lining in that your clients, you have not set any expectations with them as to how that's going to work. And we advocate, we have a conversation straight away and you get it right from day one. Yeah. And um, you could, again, your clients will be impressed with the professionalism you'll display. And it's not, so yet we, the simple answer is let, let us have a conversation that we can guide you. Yep. Yep. So on, on, on that. Where can you know? Can any? How can people find you if they're interested in, in what we've been talking about and finding out a little bit more about you, Peloton, and, and all the rest of it? Where can they find you and get a bit more info? Well, I presumably will attach some information to the show notes, will we? But LinkedIn is an obvious one. Yeah. We also, if you go on our website, you can put in you the info, some basic information in that, and we will send a the snapshot to you and compare and a comparison to your peer group. And we can have a chat after that if you prefer. But the easiest right. thing is just to just to, just to have a have a coffee and um, see where you're at. Yep. Yeah, so so there's a that's interesting. That so there's a there's a means to put some basic business data in through some portal that you have and get back a report. Obviously, you then have a conversation with them around that report too. But yes, um, yeah, it's an interesting starting point. Yep. All right. Thank you. Um, we'll, as this, as you mentioned, we'll put some kind of links to where to find you and Peloton Partners and all the rest of it into the, the show notes, wherever anyone might be listening to this from. Thanks, Rich. Appreciate uh, speaking with you today. Thanks, James. Enjoyed it. <laughs>